as I have been mentioning for the last couple of weeks. And um, I actually asked this gentleman to send me, you know, a bio about his background so I can introduce him the best I could. And I was getting tired just reading about it, so I'm going to tell you about it. Um, started off by saying, uh, first of all, apologizing for getting to me uh, so late, which he was actually a week early. <laughs> but he'd been busy with travels and the job right here at the ranch. We'll start off by saying that he manages a horse ranch in Crossroads, Texas. He was ordained, um, an ordained chaplain with the, with the Cowboys for Christ and called to this ministry about four years ago. God's ministry for him is to take Jesus to the cowboys and cowgirls wherever they are. For example, horse shows, rodeos, barrel racers, and any livestock event. He also has an authentic chuck wagon that he does special events like weddings, parties, and special events of all types, and cooks and serves the meals directly from the chuck wagon. All the cooking is done cow camp style on open fires. I presume there's plenty of campfire coffee and beans, right? There you go. Um, Lord's been preparing him for his journey for many years. He figures he was just hard-headed. That's why it took him so long to actually give in. But he did it four years ago, and he's going to be 80 years old in June. This gentleman probably doesn't look a day over. And I'm not going to say you look, you know, you're like you're turning 21 because that might be a little bit of a stretch but I don't say you, you'd look any further than maybe 55, 56 yeah, yeah that's a good thing he travels on the average of 40 weekends a year continues to supply all his needs he's also the president of the local Cowboys for Christ chapter that means monthly in Pilot Point finishes off by saying, hope this serves your needs. Looking forward to May 21st. Blessings, Hunger. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Auburn Powers. say first of all is this too loud no. okay. first of all what a joy it is for me to be here again I was here a little over a year ago and uh, we had a devotional out at the uh, had a play day on Saturday and uh, I really enjoyed that and at that time I was promised a chance to come back and so here I am <laughs> and I, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate uh, one of my best friends in this whole world who came up from uh, Aubrey today. He and his lovely wife, Jeff and Lorraine Parent, came up to uh, be with us today, and I really appreciate that, Jeff and Lorraine. I love them and their family. In fact, <clears throat> I sort of adopted them, as I do everybody. You know. Right now, I have four biological children, eight adopted children, 23 grandchildren, and eight, nine great-grandchildren. So, my family has been busy. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let me uh, start off with saying today I'm going to talk to you for just a little bit. And if I said mirrors, that would probably be a stretch. So, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to say that we're going to talk a little bit about reflections. Reflections and discipleship and evangelism. Now that sounds like a big menu for today and I promise I'll get you out of here before dark. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> Don't be concerned. 
Our scripture, one of the scriptures this morning comes from Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm going to be with you forever. I'm going to be, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I just recently acquired a, a copy of a, of a simplified cowboy version of the Bible. And I meant to bring it this morning, and I just let it slip my mind. It talks in cowboy language, something that I can understand. But, excuse me. So you'll hear me paraphrasing quite a bit this morning, uh, rather than quoting directly from the Bible. And in Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison doors to all those who are bound. This is a prophecy from Isaiah of the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it's also a prophecy for me. I was given this scripture back 100 years ago almost. No, not quite that long. But several years ago. And I tried to use it, got, let my ego get too big, and the Lord let me sit down for a while. But now I'm back where I should have been all along. In Revelation 12, 11, it says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of our testimony. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of testimony, and I apologize to Jeff, because he's already heard this part of this. Uh, but I, it's worth repeating, not that because it happened to me, but because of who, it, who made it happen to me. First of all, what is a disciple? Jesus said, follow me in Matthew 4. He didn't mean for us to follow him down the road. Because that would be impossible now since he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. But rather, it's a call for us to be set apart. So, and we're challenged and taught so that we can see and stick to the call and the mission that Christ has given us. The word disciple literally means someone who pledges to be a learner. It also means to be Christ-like. It's someone who follows another's teaching and sticks to it. It's a commitment and a process and it involves commitment and time to undertake the learning and as a Christian, a desire to imitate Jesus. In other words, and here we get to the reflection. We learn to reflect Jesus' nature. What is Jesus' nature? You know, we could go through the whole Bible and it tells us all the things that he is and that, that he does. And I give him honor and glory for every one of them. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list just a, a four, five, six of them today. And we're going to talk about those because I think those are important that we reflect those attributes that Jesus has as we live our lives daily. The first one is, is it that uh, 
Jesus was very humble. He was not an ego person. He didn't go around spouting himself. He always said, don't tell them who I am. That kind of thing. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That's found in Philippians 2. He was obedient. In Matthew 26, 42, it says, again, the second time he went away, this was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went away to pray alone. And he said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was coming. That very night, he knew they were coming to get him. He knew that on the next day, he would be tortured and beaten, his beard pulled, crown of thorns jammed down on his head. And then hung on a cross. But he was praying to God, his Father, our Father. He said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He was obedient even to death. Matthew 12, 15 tells us that he was a healer. Everywhere he went, he healed people. He healed the crowd. And no one ever went away needing his healing. When she, Matthew 12 says, when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. He withdrew, with, tried to withdraw from the crowd. But the great crowds followed him everywhere. And he healed them all. One thing that was probably the hardest thing for me to learn is to be a servant. He was the ultimate servant because he served you, he served me, he served the entire world by going to the cross, taking our sins, and the day they nailed him on the cross, he had all their powers on his mind. Amen. And I can't thank him enough for that. But if you remember in the, the Last Supper, he, after they had eaten, he took a towel and wrapped it around his waist and got a basin full of water. And he started washing the disciples' feet. When he got to Peter, Peter was just sort of a big mouth. He said a lot of things. Well, my granddad used to say he had his mouth in here before his mind was engaged. And Peter was sort of like that. He said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. Well, that got Peter's attention. And old Pete said, hey, Lord, not just my feet. Just wash me all over. Because I'm going to be your man. He was submissive. Jesus was submissive. He went all the way. Everything he did was emulating, copying what his father showed him. And submissive to the point where he took our sins to the cross and died for us.
again, we'll go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he said, Lord, let this cup pass. He didn't want to do it. The man part of him didn't want to do it. But he was still submissive to the point when he said, not my will, but truth be done. Probably the greatest thing, the greatest attribute that Jesus Christ has, and that's love. You know, I've been taught my whole life that God loves us. Jesus loves us. And boy, I had that up here. I knew. I can grab the Bible and I can prove it to you that Jesus loves you. But I'll tell you a little secret. I didn't really know it in my heart. You know, about several, about 15 years ago, I guess it was, I walked into a little chapel down on 424 in the crossroads. The day I walked in there, and I had been, by the, up until that time, I'd been estranged from my family and, and for all practical purposes, almost homeless. Hadn't been living the way I should. But the Holy Spirit drew me to that chapel that Sunday morning and as I walked in the door, the Lord spoke to me as well as I'm speaking to you today. And he said, this is home. This is home, son. So I stayed there for a long time. And there were some times when I got my toes stepped to home and I wanted to leave I wanted to do all kinds of things. But you know what? He said, this is home. So I couldn't go. I couldn't leave. And then about four years ago, in that same little chapel, one Sunday morning, he said, it's time to leave home, son. And those... 12 years or 10 or 11, 12 years, whatever it was, he had been teaching me, he had been grooming me, he had been, had me on the potter's wheel, molding me, teaching me to be submissive, teaching me not to have that humongous ego that I've always had. He wanted me to be his humble servant. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Back in 2007, the devil knew that God had something for me, that he was working on me. And I had, a, had to have an operation on one of my feet. And as I was in recovery, I was still out of it. Some of you may not accept what I'm going to say, but I saw a demon coming to get me. The best way I can describe it is that it looked like a big grub worm. Except he wasn't inching toward me. He was rolling at me, coming to me. And I'd like to say I took authority and, and cast him out, but I didn't do that. I was scared to death. But then from behind me, I heard a voice. He said, stop. You can't have him. He belongs to me. The voice of the Holy Spirit. And that demon dissolved, disintegrated, and disappeared immediately. That was the first miracle in my life. Or in my new life. 
the next year, almost a year later, I had a, a young two-year-old who had hurt himself, cut his shoulder. And he was a pastor horse and he didn't like to come into the barn. But I brought him in and I was trying to doctor him and I had him tied at a stall and somehow he got loose. And so he went to the back door which was open about of uh, the barn, which was open about like this, and started hollering at his buddies out on the pack. I said, well, I'm gonna have to boom him. So I went and got a bucket of feed and started walking up to him. Now, I've been a cowboy all my life. I know better than to walk up behind the horse. <laughs> but I, here I was with a bucket of feed and I was rattling it. I just knew he was going to turn around. I got almost to him. His back feet started bouncing. Well, when I saw that, I jumped back. And as I did, the bucket kind of held my hand back. And he, when he kicked, he kicked this hand and shattered it. There was one bone, the x-ray showed it was up into over a hundred pieces. Well, I called one of my daughters and I said, Honey, I got kicked on the hand. Can you come take me to the emergency room? She said, I'll be there in a minute. And I turned around about twice and there she was. I don't know how she got there so quickly. But anyway, she grabbed me up. We wrapped a towel around my hand, went to the emergency room. They took, it, took me in and x-rayed it. And, and uh, when we came out of x-ray, my pastor was there. How did you get here? Crystal called me. What's going on? And I told him, I said, yeah, well, you know. He looked at this thing and he said, well, let's pray. And he prayed. In the meantime, they were poking me with morphine, trying to kill the pain. So it got to feeling pretty good. I, they said, well, you're going to have to, we've already called an ambulance. The only hand doctor in the whole Metroplex is in Methodist Hospital. I said, one hand doctor for the whole Metroplex? Okay, I'll get my son-in-law to take me. No, you're going in the ambulance. Well, they finally talked me into going in the ambulance. And anyway, got there. The hand doctor looked at it. I had the CD with the x-rays and everything. I said, here they are. And he started mashing on it. And by that time, the morphine was wearing, wearing off. I said, hey, doc, that hurt. He said, well, I've got to see what's going on. I said, let's not take another, here's the x-ray, look at them. He said, well, I want to take my own. So he went and took those x a new x-rays. Came back, that, that bone that was shattered was knitted back together. I got two x-rays to prove what I'm saying to you today. Between the time I left Crossroads to the time I got to Methodist Hospital, God did a miracle in this hand. He healed. So he is a healer. The next year, I had some pains in my side. So I went to this same emergency room, in a little emergency room out on 380. Walked in there and said, hey, Mr. Powers, we're going to send you back to the hospital? I said, I hope not. <laughs> he said, I, what's wrong? And I told him. They said, well, let's, let's do a sonogram or whatever they do. I said, yep, yeah, you're going back. And I said, why? You've got an appendix fixing to explode. Well, <laughs> Back in the ambulance, back to the hospital. By the time I got there, 
that had exploded. I was feeling good. But they knew I was gonna not gonna last very long with all that poison going in there. They operated on me that night. Everything happens at night. Even though all the babies are born at night, you know. <coughs> so they operated, took everything out of me, laid it out on the table, washed it all off, stuck it back in. Sometimes I think maybe they didn't get it all just exactly the right place. But it was all back in there. Fourteen days with a, an appendix operation that I spent in the hospital. But the Lord was there. Every afternoon, I have a daughter that, that works at the hospital. Uh, every afternoon, she'd come out and read scriptures, and read stories and books to me. And then I left the hospital. Almost to the day, a year later, I couldn't sleep one night. Rolling, tumbling, couldn't get comfortable. Went back to the same emergency room. They said, uh-oh, here he is again. They put me on the table, took whatever they, <coughs> whatever they took, picture. said, the surgeon is waiting on you at the emergency room. You're going now. I don't know what's wrong. Well, you've got a little problem with your intestine. I said, well, okay. One of my other son-in-laws, Patrick, who is a, a, a paramedic, was there with me. I said, well, Patrick, come on, take me by the house. I gotta get a shaving kit, get some pajamas. She said, no, you've got to go straight to the hospital. They're waiting on you. I said, okay. I went and got Patrick's pickup, and he came, carried me straight to the hospital. Walked in, and they grabbed me, threw me on the gurney, started undressing me, going down the hallway toward the operating room. The anesthesiologist poking needles in me everywhere. Done. As it turned out, I had an intestine that got twisted and it died. A section of it died. Actually, it had already turned to jelly. So they cut me open again, took it everything out, took out two and a half feet of my intestine, put it all back together, and sent me to the root. Well, I didn't know anything about this for the next eight days. Everybody said, well, I recognized them when they came in the room and talked to them. But I don't remember any of it. I was, for all practical purposes, in a coma for eight days. Then one Friday night, the pastor came and just happened to catch the doctor. And the doctor looked at him and he said, Pastor, he said, unless I get some help, Auburn is not going to be here Monday. So he went back to the to church. They had corporate prayer on Sunday morning. Another one of my daughters was in the congregation at the time. And the Lord gave her a vision of him coming into my room and healing me. So she went and told the pastor what she had seen and he said, Honey, go talk to your dad. See if he can hear you. And tell him what you saw. Well, she walked, she and my son-in-law walked into the hospital room and I was sitting up. Had tubes going everywhere. They had a tube going straight to my heart call it a pick, and they were 
shoot me with Dilaudin, which is, I'm told, the, the strongest pain reliever that they have for humans nowadays. They were shooting me that every two hours just to keep me from screaming and yelling all the time. But when Don and Anthony walked in the, uh, in the room, I was sitting up and I said, hey. He said, Dad, Dad, I've got something to tell you. Can you hear me? Do you understand what I'm saying? I said, yes, I don't yell. <laughs> she started telling me, she says, I saw a vision. The Lord walked into your room. And I said, yeah, wait a minute, let me take finish. Oh, no, Dad, let me tell you. I said, no. He put one hand on my stomach, one hand on my forehead. She, her eyes got about that big around. She said, did you see the vision? I said, no. I saw him. And that day, he healed me. And that knowledge of his love transferred from here to here. He looked at me, didn't say a word, but in his eyes and the smile on his face was nothing but pure love, absolute, no hesitation, no reservations, love for me. Three days later, I walked out of the hospital, healed, and I like to say this because it's true. In, that was in May of 2010. That Sunday that they prayed for me just happened to have been one of God's coincidences, Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit fell. Three days later, I walked out of the hospital healed and have not even taken an aspirin since. No pain, no healing. And as Robert said, uh, uh, if the Lord turns, I know I'm going to live until He comes back. I just know that. But if He carries past June 17th, I'll be 80 years old. Well, going back now, just real quickly, and I, I don't want to take up too much time because I've got about 40 more pages. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, about four years ago, when he said, it's time to leave home now, I said, well, what? What do you want me to do, Lord? Didn't say a word. Three days later, I met the president of Cowboys for Christ, the national president. And as I shook his hand, the Lord said, this is what I want you to do. So I started questioning uh, the president's name is Dave Harvey, Dr. Dave Harvey. So I started questioning him and I said, what is, you know, what do you do? What am I, you know, if I wanted to become a part what would I be doing? And he started explaining to me. I said, man, how much more blessed can I be? An old worn out cowboy getting to go to rodeos and horse shows and barrel races and bull buckings and all of those things. And on top of that, get to share the word of Jesus Christ and his love. How much he loves all of us. Every one of us. There's not a one of you that he wants to put aside. Not a one. And I'm thankful for that. So, make a long story even longer. No. Uh, I petitioned, I made application for uh, the chaplaincy. Dave asked me one question. He said, I know you 
You want to be a chaplain. But in order for you to be ordained, you have to be called. I said, well, I'll tell you about it. And I told him, he says, hands down, we're going to set up an ordination service for you. <laughs> Get you ordained as a, as a chaplain. So, not that that makes it any, any more, but it gives a little bit of prestige. It's something I can brag about. Uh, so, I've gone all through this now, and I hope I've learned enough from him to do what he's asked me to do. It's like Robert said, I, I, you know, originally we were talking about, at the beginning of the year at the chapter, we were talking about well, I probably would go 25 weekends a month, a year. And, uh, and now, as it looks like it, I'm going to be going at least 40 this year. I've uh, already got things booked so far. But <clears throat> in any case, uh, I'm ready. And I, of course, I argued. I said, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm not a preacher. And just open your mouth, I'll put it in. Every time I had an ever objection I had, he had an answer for it. And that, you know, I, I'm not accustomed to that. I said, well, Lord, I'm 75 years old. So? What about Abraham? What about Moses? He said, and what about that little obscure fellow named Caleb? When he was 84, he ran up a mountain. He says, I expect you to do the same. So here I am. Hopefully doing what he asked me to do. And we're going to talk just real briefly about some examples of, of being a disciple. Who, they, who, who were the disciples? What they were doing? Now, you can't be a child of the King without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the power that we have to have to be a disciple, to be a witness, to be up here today. I couldn't be up here on my own today. I'd be scared to death. But even after Jesus called the twelve, he was constantly creating more disciples. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of the woman with the issue of blood. The man with the, heat, the withered hand. The blind man. You know, when he healed those people, I just cannot imagine that they went home and, and sat in their chair and didn't go out and tell, look what the Lord has done. That's telling people what has happened. What about the demoniac that came out of the tombs and gathering? He cast the demons out of him. And then the, the, the man that he had delivered said, I want to go with you, Jesus. Jesus said, no. You go home to your friends, and you tell them what good things the Lord has done for you. He gave him a commission. Go and be a disciple to others. You know, in Acts 4, when Peter and John were 
going about preaching and teaching, they were at the drop of a hat would start preaching. Well, Caiaphas, the ruler of the synagogue, called him on the carpet. said, hey, don't preach anymore in the name of this Jesus. What did Peter say? He said, I can only do what I have seen and heard. And I can only preach about Him. So, they were disciples. So what did Caiaphas do? He beat them and then turned them out. Now that was sort of the habit with the disciples. There's a something that goes along and we'll get into that just real quickly here in just a minute. But now, you know, I said we're going to talk a little bit about evangelism. Uh, the meaning of evangelism is almost synonymous with being a disciple. It says I'm a learner, I'm going and telling people about the good news. Well, in Acts 8, uh, Philip the Evangelist was sent down to the, on the road to Gaza. There was an Ethiopian eunuch who was in charge of the treasury for Queen Candace. And he was sitting in his chariot reading the scriptures. And Philip walked up to him and says, Do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch says, how can I understand unless somebody teaches me? Well, what does Philip do? He climbs up in the chariot and sits down by him. And they started expounding on the scriptures. What did the eunuch do? The eunuch says, here's water. What to prevent me from being baptized? So he was baptized, saved, baptized. You think he went home and didn't say anything to Candace or any of the others about his experience? No. He would be like any of us, happy with what had happened. Let's talk about the number one, in my opinion, the number one uh, disciple, evangelist, apostle, you just name what just call it any name that would describe Saul of Tarsus. You know the Damascus Road experience uh, was something. Now I've been thrown. I've fallen off of horses. It is not a fun thing. But can you imagine being knocked off of a horse and blinded at the same time? Well, that was what Saul experienced. But the Lord had prepared for him. And he looked up, or looked, I said looked up, he raised his head and said, Lord, Lord, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. That got his attention. He had already prepared, the Lord had already prepared Ananias to go and minister to Saul. And as he, Ananias was not any different than I am, he started questioning, Lord, you know that man came to Damascus to imprison all of your disciples. Maybe even kill some of us. He said, I've got something great for him to do. He said, he's been struck blind. But now you've got to go and restore his son. Jesus told Ananias, this man Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. Now that's pretty exciting. What a ministry. 
He was given a ministry before kings. But when Ananias laid hands on him and he recovered his sight, I'm not sure he understood or heard even a lot of what Ananias was saying. But he was telling him about the ministry that the Lord had called him to. But he also told him something else. He said, I will also show you, saying, or quoting the Lord, I will also show you how much you must suffer for my sake. I don't think that really bothered Saul. I don't think he even realized what was said. But he was destined to be a great hero of faith, doing all the mighty works of evangelism. But first he had to be discipled. So, we're called to be disciples. We're also called to be evangelists. Cornelius was a centurion and a Gentile. And he sent his servants to Peter. He said, come and tell us about the Lord. Peter did. He and his household were saved. They were disciples. Gentiles. Okay. Evangelism is an obvious and essential part of, a, of our Christian life. We're called to share the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody. Most any Christian would agree with this. But how many of us make a constant effort to preach the gospel? Now, a lot of us are scared by the word preach. But actually, the word preach literally does not mean you got to stand behind a pulpit. But I can preach. Jeff Barrett can preach. Sit at the coffee table in the mornings. We go to coffee shop and have coffee most mornings. We have some of the best discussions and the best sharing she you've ever had at that coffee shop. So you can do that. Kids can be in school and share with their friends. That's what a being an evangelist is. That's what sharing the gospel is all about. We can make known the good news of what God has done for us wherever, whenever, and with whomever is open and will listen to us. Or even just, in my case, if you then just slow down so I can keep up with them, I'm going to talk to them about it. <clears throat> I, I've never been behind a bucking shoe and walk up to a young cowboy that's fixing to get in the, on the back of one of those big old bulls and say, let me pray for you. Oh, please do. I've never had a one of them say, oh, no, don't pray for me. They know what they're going to do. They're going to get on that, that bull that's going to do his best to kill them. So they want all the help they can get. And I take advantage of that because I'll, I'll pray. I'll pray for them at the drop of a hat. I know what they're going through because that's what I did when I was young, real young and foolish. But we make them make make the good news known. Regardless of how much we don't want to do it. It's a matter of just making our minds up and going after it. I don't know about what you do about altar calls or do you have an altar call? Well, I'm going to 
throw a little kink in it. This morning, I hope you'll forgive me. But there are, there may be someone here that's uh, at a point in their life where they're not experiencing the victory that Jesus has promised. Well, he's here. Now, if your elders want to come up and pray with, uh, if there's anybody here that needs prayer for any of these, the elders are here. All you've got to do is just come up here. The hardest thing in the world to do is take the first step. The rest of it's easy. Salvation is easy. He hasn't made it difficult at all. I'm going to pray for just... Lord God, we just bless you. We honor you because of who you are. We honor you and Jesus for what he did to buy our salvation. We love you. We ask you that you just open the windows of heaven. Pour out your spirit upon us, all flesh today. Drawing us near and dear to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was amazing. Let's give a big round of applause for Brother Alvin Howard.